predictability. The milkman, the paperboy, the evening TV. Everybody eventually says that they're. House of Ed Tech, episode 55. Hi, this is Danny Kennis from dannykennis.com, and you're listening to the House of Ed Tech with the amazing Chris Nessie. This episode of the House of Ed Tech is brought to you by audible.com. Did you know that by listening to this podcast, you have the right to, well, no, you are entitled to, by birth, two free audiobooks. The way you can get them from audible.com? is by going to chrisnessy.com slash audible and signing up for a free 30-day trial of Audible's great service. Check out two free audiobooks that are yours to keep, and you can support a podcast you love. Once again, go to chrisnessy.com slash audible to get your two free audiobooks today. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Christopher Nessie, and the House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. My objectives include discussing technology that is changing our classrooms and schools and sharing tools and tips that you can hear about today and use tomorrow. I talk to teachers, leaders, and creators just like you and have them share their stories. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. And welcome to another episode of the Fuller House of Ed Tech. <laughs> I, I couldn't resist using some of the new catchy intro to Netflix's new Fuller House series. I... I have not seen all 13 episodes, but Caitlin and I enjoyed the first episode when season one dropped on Netflix on Friday, February 26th. And you know what? What I like best about the show so far is how the actors have made getting back into their iconic roles look so easy. And, you know, to be honest, you would never know that it's been 20 years or so since the original Full House went off the air. I recommend checking it out, so that's like a free recommendation. Uh, and if you haven't, you know, you know, do so if you have Netflix. Um, and speaking of settling into familiar roles, in this episode of the podcast, of course, we are going to have an EdTech thought, an EdTech recommendation, and of course, the House of EdTech VIP. And this episode, we are returning a little bit more to our regularly scheduled format, and I do have a guest and some great featured content and I'm going to be sharing a conversation that I had with a good friend of mine who is not a stranger to the show, Alex Rosenwald. So that's going to be fun. Before I get to that, just a little bit of feedback. Uh, first up, thank you to Jane Miller from Chalk Up for a recent blog post where she has over a, a couple of months and in, in the spring and then the fall and now here again in the winter, uh, she's written posts about blogs and podcasts that she enjoys and recommends. And she talked about the House of Ed Tech. Uh, and she had this to say, quote, Chris Nessie is killing it with this one. Probably one of our favorite new finds. This podcast, talking about the House of Ed Tech, melds expert guests with Nessie's Ed Tech experience in thematic episodes. His guests are solid, an element that stood out to her after listening to a few episodes was the balance of educators, bloggers, chat moderators, and tech specialists who make the rounds on the show. Thank you so much, Jane. And if you're not familiar with Chalk Up, be sure to head over to chalkup.co and uh, see what Chalk Up can do for you. Also, I've begun to receive a few, bit of, few bits of feedback for the new segment where you're asking me questions about ed tech or just tech questions in general or even just education questions. Um, I want to get a few more so I can kind of have a bank built up. So as soon as I get a few more of those, I will start to use them here on the show and really, you know, build up this new segment. The way you can get that question to me is to tweet using the hashtag house of ed tech. You can Vox me. My username is Mr. Nessie, or you can call the, uh, the house of ed tech feedback hotline 
at 732-903-4869. Two other updates. First, my supervisor program at Rowan University. I am preemptively, as I record this and release it, done. I've taken the two leadership courses I need to take, and as soon as they post on my transcript, I will be sending off my paperwork and my materials to the state of New Jersey to get my supervisor certificate. So this is very exciting, and as I've been talking for a few months, hopefully this will begin to move me in the direction that I want to go in in education. Um, Also recently, I had the opportunity to make a guest appearance back at Caldwell University, where I got my master's in curriculum and instruction, and I got to guest appear in my former advisor, uh, Elena Chernobylski, her her class to undergrad education people. <laughs> it's, it's been a long day. I attended an end camp today, so this is so much off the cuff, but, you know, I'm doing what I need to do to get this episode out to you. So I hope you appreciate it. Um, but to get back on track... I recently got the chance to go back to Caldwell uh, and talk to some undergrad people who want to be teachers, and they're taking a technology education course. So I talked about podcasting and the power of podcasting and how to get into podcasting and what software you can use. So it was just a really great experience to go up there and interact with pre-service teachers, which was the words I was struggling to find over the last uh, 45 seconds or so. <laughs> um That's all the updates, so we can actually right now get into this episode's EdTech Thought. For this episode's EdTech Thought, really, I'd like to take this opportunity to basically blow the doors wide open here on the House of EdTech. I'd like to get you more involved as a listener and give you another opportunity where you can be a part of the podcast. Now, if you're a long time listener, you know what this segment is all about. And if you're new to the podcast, first, thank you for checking out the podcast. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you will come back for more episodes and go back and listen to older episodes. But this segment, my ed tech thought is a little corner of the show where I tend to voice my opinion about something in the world of education and or technology Uh, Or I really just share some heart-to-heart advice based on my experiences as an educator um, in this crazy little thing called life. Now, I'd really like to offer you the opportunity to share your own EdTech thought in future episodes. Now, trust me, I'm not going away. I'm going to still give my thought. But if you have something you'd like to share or something that, you know, even if it irks you or concerns you or it's just a topic in education that you want to bring to people's attention and share your thoughts and opinions about, I'd like to give you the opportunity and the platform to be heard. See what I did there? It's a podcast. People will hear you. Or, you know what? If you've got a question or a topic that you'd like my view on, you can reach out and share your idea, and perhaps you will inspire me in a future EdTech thought. And all the same ways that you can contact me apply, whether it's Twitter, calling the hotline, reaching out to me on Voxer, Those are the ways that you can do that, and I will mention those again at the end of the episode. Or as always, you know, you can just head over to chrisnessy.com, and you can contact me through the website. That's my EdTech thought, and hopefully you'll take me up on the opportunity to share your thoughts with the rest of the community. now for this episode's EdTech recommendation. I have a great new podcast that I'd like to recommend to you. Now, this podcast isn't on the Education Podcast Network, but this is a cool one that I recently found, and I think you should check it out. This podcast is called Stories Teachers Share. Stories Teachers Share is a podcast about what it's like to be a teacher and what we can learn from them. So people like you and me. It comes from the team at the wildly popular education blog, MindShift, and it's produced out of NPR member station, KQED. Teaching is a deeply personal profession, as you and I both know. We give so much of ourselves to our students, we nurture relationships, 
and we trust students along the way. It's those intangibles that don't always show up on standardized tests and rarely get discussed in the media. Few people ever know the truth about what it's really like to be a teacher or what a great impact we have on someone else's life. A lot of those experiences are locked away in our classrooms or become sentiments that are never shared with the ones who might need to hear it the most. This podcast, Stories Teachers Share, will not only paint a picture of the men and women spending more than six hours a day with children, but it will also help reveal how much each of us is a teacher, and as a teacher yourself, you can gain some insight into the stories that other teachers are sharing and what their experiences are. So check out Stories Teachers Share in your favorite podcast catching app, and you can also check out the podcast on the website, kqed.org slash mindshift. And that's this episode's EdTech Recommendation. And now it's time for the featured content of this episode. As I said in the opening of the show, uh, I'm bringing back Alex Rosenwald, who... Now, I'm going to repeat myself because I'm going to say it here, and then you're going to hear it again in about 10 seconds when we go to the pre-recorded conversation. Um, but in advance of that, thank you to you, Alex, for coming back on the show. And uh, let's just get right into a conversation that I recently had with my good friend, Alex Rosenwald. <laughs> For the first time ever, besides my wife, I have a live in-the-studio guest, and we're going way back to the beginning, so it's like throwback Thursday or throwback way Saturday. back Wednesday. So welcome back to the House of Ed Tech, my first guest ever, Mr. Alex Rosenwald. Wow, I didn't realize I was your first guest ever. You were the first guest, and you were actually the first person who I spoke to because when I first started doing this... In the very first episode, I didn't know what I was doing. Right. I found it very difficult to talk to nobody. That's so true. So I actually taped up a picture of you, and I talked to it. I thought we FaceTimed, didn't we? No, no, no. When I, the first episode, there was no guest. Oh. But I right. recorded it like 10 times. So to make it easy, I was like, I need to talk to somebody. So and you I, talked to my picture? Oh, I talked a, to your picture. That's adorable. <laughs> so 54, 55 episodes later, how you been? What are you up to? So I tried administration for a while. I was a district supervisor in a couple of districts, supervising science and various other content areas. But, you know, really in the grand scheme of things, I found I missed the connection to the kids. So now I'm back in the classroom. I'm teaching physics at Princeton High School, uh, teaching a couple sections of AP physics, AP physics one, and a couple of sections of college prep. So it keeps me busy. It's reminded me why I like doing what I do, you know, that connection with the kids. You know, I don't, I wouldn't say that a, another torn admin would be out of the question sometime in the future, but for right now I'm where I want to be and being in the classroom is good. So I can understand that. I, I could see myself, you know, I, I, before I pressed record, I was talking to you and updating you about where I'm at with getting my supervisor cert. So I, I'm a big believer of, you know, being connected to the kids and, but I also know you being that we're friends that. Whatever you touch in education, you're going to succeed at. Oh, thank you. So I, I, I value and really appreciate and understand wanting to work with the kids. Yeah, it was one of those things where I just found myself I was working in an office. And, and not that that's a bad thing. And I like working with adults just fine. But the reason why I got into education in the first place was because I liked working with the kids. And so it's just kind of refreshed my, my inner educator, for lack of a better term. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. You know, I mean, every school building is different. Every school district is different. Princeton High School, I mean, if you look at the rankings, you know, it's, you know, you look at U.S. News, World Report, and Niche, and all those rankings, you know, it's very highly regarded. Um, and everybody says that to me. They're like, oh, man, Princeton High School, that must be great. You know, kids are really easy probably to teach. And it's like, well, no, kids are kids. You know, they have their needs. Every, every kid is different. You know, my kids are just as needy as any other student that I've ever taught. It's just different. You know, their, their needs are different. It's a different, you know different needs, different community. It's a very dynamic place to work. I will tell you that the students that I have this year are probably some of the, the most driven students I've ever had. And I've taught, you know, in, in I mean, you know, I mean, I've taught at Howe High School, Manalpin High School, you know, those are well-regarded schools. 
it's amazing though what some of these kids are able to do. So I'll tell you a really funny story if if you don't mind. We um let's do it. Okay, so we have a science bowl team at Princeton High School, which I I never you know didn't even know that that was a thing. Um, and it's really like Jeopardy, where they have the little buzzers and they, and they have to buzz in and they have to recognize you and they're very specific. About Does Comcast or Cablevision televise these they, events on you public would access? Thi- you would think so. <laughs> so it's one of these things where I guess as part of their practice, they like to take the teachers on. So I'm like, yeah, cool. I like Jeopardy and I like trivia. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm good at that. Let me, you know, I like science. Let me give it a try. Chris, these kids crushed us. Like they absolutely annihilated oh, like, us. like a team of your so colleagues. It was like it was like four teachers versus four students and they had three different teams there was the c team the b team and the a team and we did well against the c team and then the b team came in and we held our own we were like okay you know we kind of rotated in and out the b team kind of tied us and then the a team kids came on and sat down dude they annihilated us like the score was like 70 to 4 like they they absolutely crushed us and it wasn't even the fact that they were it wasn't the fact that they knew the content that was so scary it was how fast they were able to answer these questions that their minds were so quick it was it was just absolutely amazing to me that that there are students out there that have that are able to do the things that these kids do and and I mean and this is just a very small subset of the population of Princeton but it's just it's it's just amazing that some of the students that I've met over the course of the school year, they do some amazing stuff. Some of the, some of the things that they do and their future plans. It's just it's very refreshing to me as an educator that there are students out there that are able to do these things because you know it's it's just very cool. It's a novel experience. When you say that those kids were fast in answering the questions. Do they understand the content or are they just really quick to recall things that they've memorized? No, it was it was problem solving type questions. So one of them was and I'll use a physics example because that was one of the questions. It was a question on impulse where it was just, you know, you have a you have an object and a force is applied to it. And, you know, in this amount of time and before they were even able to actually formally like ask the question, the kids were already you know, doing the calculations quickly in their head, seeing what the situation was, applying whatever the the procedural knowledge is to it, and coming up with an answer. It, it, it wasn't just, yeah, granted there were some recall type questions, but a lot of, especially, you know, the chemistry and the physics ones were a lot more applied. It was, here's a situation, here's a problem. You know, you want to pitch a spacecraft that's rotating in a certain direction. You want it to pitch upwards if it's rotating counterclockwise, what direction do the thrusters have to go? Like that's a, that's a very in-depth type of physics problem. You know, that we cover in AP Physics, but they were able to very quickly, you know, get the answers, you know, be able to apply the knowledge, you know, in in, in a meaningful way. So, no, it's not just like Jeopardy where it's a recall. These kids were actually problem solving quickly. It was it was very impressive. Now, you're back in the classroom and the last time that I had you on, we had started we we started to delve into technology in the science classroom. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you were out of the classroom. So now that you're back in it. What are some of the things that you're doing now back in that physics classroom that you're integrating technology? Well, what are some of the things you're doing in the sciences to bring tech in? Well, the, the, as a district, we're, we're starting to see more of a push over to Google Classroom, to, to and we're seeing that on a district level. So that's not necessarily something I'm doing on the science, you know, just in science, but that's something that we're going to start to see on the whole moving forward, probably starting next year. I know it's really big in the middle schools. They're trying to transfer that up into the high school. Me, I'm still really comfortable with my WordPress page and Dropbox. Like, I mean, that's just, maybe it's a little old school at this point, you know, with things like Weebly coming out, you know, and stuff, but... I'm more comfortable with my drive with my uh, with my WordPress page. Um, we do a lot of work with um, you know with video analysis. I might have mentioned it the last time I was on. We use something called Tracker. It's open source physics um, where we're able to take videos and do frame by frame analysis of motion of objects. Um, we're able to do statistical analysis based on that. It's actually really neat. Um, now, it, when you say like frame by frame, what mm-hmm. comes to mind is you know in a lot of these cell phones you have like the slow mo video function, mm-hmm. and it's like. National Geographic slow, like on the hummingbird. Right. So are you able to bring in some of that mindset and get so, the kids doing that kind of thing? So what we do is because, again, we're analyzing, we're trying to build models based, you know, that help us describe motions of objects, you know. So we're able to take, in, in the simplest example, um, we'll drop like a tennis ball, you know, and we're able to actually see it frame by frame as it's falling and see the difference in the change in displacement from 
second to second, or in this case, because we're doing frame by frame, it's like 0. 0.033 seconds. I think it's, I think it's 180 frames per, per, per second. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but, um, we're able to actually see, okay, so that in this early interval, the distance between the two, you know, between the golf ball or the, the tennis balls falling is shorter. You know, later on in the video, we're able to see that between the next two intervals that it's further. Well, it ex- helps us explain things like acceleration. We can see that if an object is moving at constant velocity, that the distance that it's traveling in each frame is going to be the same versus not. Um, I do a really interesting thing where I have them play, um, they play catch on the front lawn of the school. They're able to track the parabolic motion. They're able to see um, acceleration in the Y direction while accelerate or while uh, acceleration is zero in the X direction. They're able to take these. It's nice for me because one of my goals is that I don't want to give them the answer. I want them to, you know, use their knowledge of how we've built the model and apply it. So when we're doing something like projectile motion, I don't really tell them, I'm like, okay, I want you to analyze the motion in the X, analyze the motion in the Y. What kind of conclusions can we draw from that? And the, the software is really, the, the actual software is really neat because all you're doing is clicking where the ball is and it plots its position. It keeps track of where its position is. It knows the time interval because it knows the video and then it generates graphs. It can do like, you know, when you're curve fitting and, you know, statistical analysis, it's, it's really neat. Um, it's one of those things that then once they get used to using the program, you can apply it to momentum. You can apply it to circular motion. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that we can do with it, but we even go low tech. Just the fact that every kid in my classroom for the most part has either an iPhone or a, or a, you know, or a smartphone of some, you know, of some kind. The fact that we have the slow-mo videos, we were doing something the other day. We wanted to do a little bit of a low-tech lab. Um, I didn't, you know, we didn't have the laptops, whatever, you know. So it was one of those things where we did a little bit more quick and tawdry where the kids were able to run the stopwatch in the frame of the video. And they were able to take a slow-mo video while the things were moving and the stopwatch was running. So they were able to get time intervals that were these short little time intervals because they were really only measuring displacement changes in like centimeters and it was one of those things that even though we didn't have the frame by frame we were able to use the slow-mo video along with the camera and it was just it was amazing it's something that i couldn't have done that kind of lab five years ago because the technology wasn't there um and and for me i'm using the kids technology you know it's amazing to me and it's changed the way i teach not necessarily what i'm using with technology half my kids show up with laptops every day so it changes how I approach education because it just gives me instantaneous knowledge where we were doing something. What did I want to know? Even something as simple as like the radius of the earth where it's like, you know, okay, well we got to figure this out real fast. We're, we're doing you know, rotational dynamics. And I want to know what the angular displacement of somebody on the planet is and the angular velocity. I'm sorry for getting all nerdy with you. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, sh- I'm following as best I can. I'm sure there are science teachers who listen who are like, yeah, we're right with you, yeah. Alex. So what ends up happening is when it's just like, oh, well, you know, back in the day, if we were doing this, you and I back in high school, we'd have to go to like the library to look up what the orbital rate, you know, the average orbital radius of the earth is. Now I would have went to the back and got the Encyclopedia Britannica. Exactly. Where all these kids now are just like, hey, Siri, what, you know, what's the orbital radius? Of the earth? Hey, Siri, what's 12 feet in meters? You know, it's one of those things where it changes the way you teach because, you know, when we were Learning things like chemistry and dimensional analysis, like metric conversions, right? You know, you had to learn that 2.53 centimeters was an oh, inch yeah. and all that jazz. <laughs> it makes you wonder, like, do they really need to know it now because all they have to do is just ask Siri? You know, I'd rather, you know, so I'm at a point now with them where it's changed the way I teach because it's made me get deeper in terms of my content. Deeper well, from everything that you're describing, you know, that, that we can very quickly and the students can very quickly get the facts, the dates, whether, you know, social studies, they can get the facts, the figures, but what technology I don't think replaces only enhances is how they experience the exploration factor. You know, the fact that oh, yeah. you're not giving them the answers, but they're really experiencing, in this case, physics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's one of those things that I try and do. Well, unless I'm by no means the perfect physics teacher, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. There are plenty of people out there that do it a whole lot better than I do. But it's one of those things where it just technology helps me because it just gives me another resource that I can help have the kids reach. Um, I'm trying to think of other stuff that I do. I use a lot of remind. I find remind is like the greatest tool ever. Um, even, and I was talking with one of our vice principals. Um, I use it when I'm going to be out sick. Like if I know I'm going to be out sick, it's very easy for me to be like, Hey nerds, I'm out sick. today. <laughs> here's, you know, here's a link to, you know, go check my webpage, you know? And then for sub assignments, it's just like, Oh, you know, when I have to email my supervisor, I just say, Hey, you know, don't worry about a sub assignment. Everything's online. They were told, you know, this morning to go print something out like they're, they're on top of it. It just is a way it's just another line of communication that makes it 
easy for me to interact with my kids and get them going to where I want them to be. You know, even if it's something as simple as, oh, hey, you know, I, I posted a second problem set or there's more review stuff online. It just it just gives me another avenue of communication. I like it also because it's monitored. You know, it's not everything's logged. You know, there's it's a one way you know, I don't, ha- I don't have it set up that the kids can respond back to me, which is, which is the way I'd rather it be. Um, but yeah, it's amazing, you know, in that regard, something that I found really interesting, and this is something new again, you know, again, not having been out of the classroom for a while, there's an AP physics one, Mr. Rosenwald group on Facebook that my kids are all a part of. Did you create it? I did not. And I only found out about it. It was very randomly cause it was, it was, we were doing something and they took a picture of me and, and I was, you know, again, I was fine. I was like, you know, Hey, that shouldn't go anywhere. And they're like, no, 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 we're going to post it in the group page. And I'm like, well, what group page? And they're like, Oh, well, there's an AP physics one group. I just found it really fascinating that students are using Facebook and it's a Facebook group, you know, for communicating. And, and it was one of the, it was something else where one of my young ladies was out sick and I was like, Oh, just, you know, make sure, you know, so-and-so gets the assignment or gets the notes. And they're like, Oh, don't worry about it. We already posted, you know, whatever it was, they'd snapped the picture of it. It was, or they were doing something with a whiteboard and she's like, Oh, don't worry about it. We already posted it up in the group page. And I was just like, that's a really neat thing that students, again, independent of me as a teacher are, yeah, you didn't are, set this up. You, they took the initiative. Exactly. And, and it's one of those things where it's like, you know, we talk about the power of social media and here are the kids now finding a way to leverage social media for academic and, and, you know, academic gains and an academic reason. It made me, and again, you know, I've gone on and off whether or not I think Facebook is a good thing or not. And it's one of those things where it's just like, wow, like, you know what, like maybe some of the stuff that we're trying to get across. And I think when I say we, I mean like, you know, ed tech people that, that are into technology and see the benefits of it. Maybe we're really getting through to them somehow that, that they're, they are seeing independent of the adults. They're seeing the benefit of finding a space online where they can collaborate. You know, I mean, we, you know, you and I and, and everybody else who's probably listening to this, you know, we have our spaces where we can collaborate online, whether that's, you know, Twitter, hashtags, whatever. But the fact that they did that, I thought it was like the coolest thing ever. I was like, wow. And I, I went home. I told my wife, I was like, I was like, you're never going to believe this. And I went, and I did a little search. I kind of like Facebook stalked them a little bit, you know, again, and I just saw like the, the cover page, but it's like Mr. Rosenwald's AP physics one group. I was like, all right, like way to go kids. Like, good job. You know, it's just one of those things that again, you know, it kind of refreshes me as an educator. It makes me feel like what we're doing is, is good that that I saw that and I, and, and again, completely independent. And when I asked the, one of the young ladies, um, in my class, I was like, yeah, it's really neat. And she's like, yeah, we have one for every, you know, I set up or in this one, one young lady. She's like, I set up one for every class that I'm in. And she takes the initiative and she's like, you know what? We do better when we're talking together and we do better when we're working together. And it's not just the one class. Cause again, I have three sections of AP it's kids from all three of those sections are in there talking and collaborating, whatever. I don't know what they're saying. I mean, they can be saying that I'm a you know big old idiot, you know, for all I know, but, um, cause it's closed, but just the fact that they're not just reaching across getting collaborating with their class, but they're reaching across my other sections as well. I, I, to me, I just think that it's everything that we see the positive nature of social media, you know, in action. Well, it's, it's pretty cool. That That is that is like super cool. I, and, and my thoughts as I'm hearing you share that are one, if they did it on their own and they figured that out, that's like the best case scenario. You know, but, I mean, odds are maybe at some point in their academic career, a teacher had a group set up and maybe, you know, and, and they learned that. And then, you know, the big buzzword, digital citizenship, teaching these students how to take advantage of and properly use tools like this. I mean, again, best case scenario. I also found it interesting that you said it's closed. You're not in the group. Did you ask? Were you invited? Or you have want no part of it? No, truthfully, it's one of those things where I think that like any teenager, you know, teenagers work well when they're working with adults. I think teenagers work well when they're working facilitated by adults. But I think at some point, you know, teenagers also work well in high school students work well when they're working on their own. You know, they don't. And again, if one of ostensibly if one of the goals of high school teaching is to prepare students for college, well, we want to prepare them for a spot where they're not necessarily having an adult looking over their shoulder. So for me, I also give them that respect that, you know what, that's their privacy. That's their, that's their space, you know, where they can interact. And if they have issues with me that they can kind of like hash them out. Listen, I know, you know, listen, I've had kids come to me and say, Hey, you know, I've got a concern or a question about your policy or this or that or whatever. That's fine. I don't want to see, I don't want to see the back end discussion of that. I would rather if there's a concern or an issue that's being discussed there, I'd rather get 
hashed out, formalized, you know, distilled, whatever, then come to me with it. You know, because I, again, I don't know what's going on in that space. And part of me is naturally curious. You know, I, I think that anybody would be curious about it. But at the same time, that's their space. You know, our, our shared space is when we're together in the classroom, when we're interacting, you know, in, in you know, during the school day. That's that's for them. And so and I didn't ask. I wouldn't request. You know, it's not for me to request. And one of the kids said, they're like, oh, we'll invite you in. And I'm like, well, no, because also, you know what, not to be silly, you know, my Facebook presence is my Facebook presence. I don't have a professional Facebook presence. It's my personal Facebook presence. And so I always very, I'm always very careful to make sure that that is at least, you know, to the outward, what, what the public can see is always very professional. Not that it's not that it's not. I mean, because I'm not, you know, I'm not a crazy party guy or anything, but, you know, my space is my space. You know, that's that's for me. It's not for them. So therefore, I look at it as a two-way street. You know, I have my Facebook privacy set so that like whereas kids can find me, you know, they can't necessarily request to be my friend and that's the way I want it. So, you know. And actually, the, the other question that, that comes to mind is would something like this have been as effective if in September you came in and said, hey, I set up a Facebook group for everybody? I, no. I, I don't think it would work. No, I don't think so. I think that the organic nature of it because, you know, what ends up happening is – and again – the way they have their settings is that I can see who's, you know, I mean, like any group, you can, you know, if they have it set up the right way, you can see who's in and see who's not. Not all my students are in that Facebook group. And it's, you know, it, it's one of those things where because it's more organic, the kids that are interested in being involved in it are going to be the ones that are going to join. Whereas I have, listen, I have students that aren't really physics lovers and I have students that, you know, are maybe don't need that. So why? Why have them kind of clutter things up? You know, the message and, and, and the goal could be maybe lost, you know, and maybe you know, maybe diluted a little bit. Whereas the kids that are involved in that are involved for a reason. They've got their whatever their reasons are, you know, ostensibly to, to share, you know, data and share, you know, strategies and, you know, give, you know, lift each other up. I would rather it be more organic like that. I mean, I don't think there's any harm in suggesting that at the beginning of the year, but I, but it was just very interesting that it just kind of happened on its own with a little direction from like, me. Like, could you see yourself next September or this coming September suggesting to new students who you, who who you're coming in coming in to meet that hey, this is what kids did last year. It was really effective. Would you make that recommendation? I think I think what I would do is I would ask the students that organized it this year, if they felt that overall, if it, if it was worthwhile and if they thought that it was kind of maybe enumerate that I like doing that, you know, and it's something I used to do where I'd have my kids from the previous year, kind of write a letter to the, you know, or, you know, make like a top five things that will make you successful. in Mr. Rosenwald's. What a novel class. idea. Get input and feedback from students. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Who would have thought, um, you know, but not even, but not even for me, just more like, you know, if you were going to give advice to somebody who was coming in next year and taking my cl- this class fresh, like what would you tell them? And invariably it's things like, don't give up. Don't, you know, don't get disheartened. It's going to be hard. Make sure your calculator set in degrees. Like it's so you know stuff like that. But you know, I would ask the the people that were involved, the kids that were involved in that you know creation of that online space, was it worthwhile? You know, looking back and reflecting on your year, did you think that it was a worthwhile experience participating in something like that? Would you recommend to the students to do that for next year? Here's what I'm going to suggest to you because we're buddies. All right, have them make a trailer for AP, <laughs> like a video, like a movie trailer. You know, in Mr. Rosenwald's world. In <laughs> and, a world. Yeah, in, in a world. Make, make Could that be a project where they make a video to it could. sell and promote your course? I've had a bunch of kids ask me what we're going to do after the AP exam. That's a very popular That's topic. That's a big question and for it's AP so funny kids. Because, <laughs> it's so funny because, again, you know, it's mid-February as we're, as we're taping this. Um, and AP isn't until, you know, first week in May. That's kind of cool. I like that. That might be a good idea. I might have to borrow that from you, my friend. Hey, that, that's what we're all about here on the House of Ed Tech. <laughs> um, yeah, it's – it's, and with the proliferation of technology, I mean, again, you know, I have access to a, a MacBook cart and a Chromebook cart, but it's powerful enough as a – and again, you know, I'm fortunate in the fact Princeton is a, is a, is a relatively well-to-do school. The, you know, the, the, the families are, you know, again, you know, not it, – it's a div- got a diversity in terms of socioeconomics, but – you know, I have students, I look at some of the machines that they're running and they're all running rigs that are faster than my old, you know, than my Dell. And not that that's a bad thing, but it just, it, it's very, it's very apparent, you know, how technologically savvy a lot of these students are. It's very amazing to me that like, so I have a couple of kids in my first period class that are very big into computer science where I, they get to school early and they're all 
co- Java coding away in, in, you know, in, in my classroom before the bell, you know, these kids are very tech savvy. I, I, I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of the term digital native. I don't know. It just never really resonated with me. Um, but I mean, it exists there. I can understand maybe not liking the term, but yeah, you know, I suppose, and maybe maybe it's weird for me because I guess I've always been a digital native. You know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't. It's hard for me to see that because I view myself as being tech savvy and a, a, a digital native. So I guess I don't. But there was a point in our lives where there was not this abundance of technology. It's where true. From it's Jump a, Street, they've had it. And so the point is, is that it, with the kids having all this technology, these kids are amazing. Like, and again, even things like Google Docs. You know, we talk about things organically. You know, when I say to the kids, "Hey, I want you to you know, wait back at the beginning of the year," I say, "You know, what's the best way for you guys to submit things?" And they're like, "Don't worry about it. When we do labs, we just automatically collaborate. We type it up on Google Docs, then we'll just share access with you." And it, I didn't even have to tell them that. Like, That's awesome. And it's just like. All right, I, 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 like that's that's awesome. Like, way to go! So, so um, not for nothing. What are you doing for these kids? Well, I mean, <laughs> well, listen, I, I'll be honest with you. Some of these kids, truthfully, I mean, I'm I, I have a couple of kids. There's one kid in particular in my first period class who's I don't know if he's gotten a question wrong yet. Like during over the course of the year, you know, these kids just come in with passion and with knowledge, and the, especially the kids that are really into physics, they just they just they they challenge me, you know, and they'll they'll give ask me a question. I'll be like, look. We can talk about that after class, but like you're about like a college semester ahead of where we are, you know, of the complexity of where we're at right now. One of actually the hardest problems that I face is getting kids to realize that it's an algebra-based physics class, and all these want to all these kids want to do is do calculus-based physics, which I'm I'm fine with. And I say to them, I'm like, look, you wanna you wanna give me an integral, and you wanna you wanna work on it from a calculus point of view. You're more than welcome to. I said, but realize that I'm teaching it from an algebra based point of view. So it's sometimes getting the kids to kind of almost like hit the pump the brakes a little bit, you know, be, for the needs of the class. I would never tell them not to do it that way, but right. Um, but they, it, really, what it comes down to, I guess, what am I doing for them? I mean, in terms of education, it's annihilating their physics misconceptions. It's it's you know realizing that there are certain things that the growing up and, and, and how we perceive the world and, you know, things like superhero movies and stuff like that, you know, how it throws off our perception of what physics is. My job is to kind of destroy their misconceptions and kind of put them back together the way I want them to, to think. So, so as we, as, as we're coming down to the wire and I even hate to say that because it's a podcast, I could talk to you for four or five hours and we're, we're going to go hang out afterwards. I know. <laughs> uh, but when you talk about misconceptions, what, in your experience, you can either do it this year or over your career. When you bust the physics misconceptions, what is what is the biggest misconception that you defeat, put down, dispel? Well, uh, so one of the biggest ones, and actually I'll tell you, I, I might have posted this on Facebook just recently, um, the idea of zero gravity. Um, you know, we think of zero G, right? We've heard that, you know, like the right stuff and, you know, and astronauts and astronauts are in zero G. Well, they're really not. They're really in a state of free fall. So if you, if you think about what's happening as they orbit, they're really not, not experiencing gravity. They're still experiencing the force of gravity from the earth. It's just a little bit less because they're further away. And because their orbital path is in a circle, it's always directed inward is what keeps them in a uniform circular path. But the idea is, you know, when we look at guys like, you know, Scott and Mark Kelly up in the, up in the ISS and they're floating around all happy as a clam. Well, the kids are like, Oh, well, they're in zero gravity. They're, they're not being affected by gravity. Well, no, they are. They are. It's, it, it, that's, I guess, one of the biggest ones where, where they start to think about it and they're like, oh, well, yeah, I guess, I guess they are being affected by gravity, aren't they? And it's like, well, well yeah, because if they weren't affected by gravity, they'd be traveling off in a, you know, in a, in a, in, in, in a, one in direction, a, in, right? Well, they'd be in a tan- in tangent to the circular path. Um, but yeah, I think the idea of zero G really throws them off. And so the reason why I posted it on Facebook is because I guess, uh, okay, go had come out with a, a, a video. I don't know if you've seen it or not. And they do like, the, I love their music videos. Um, and they did one where they were on the, uh, the vomit comet. It's the, uh, it's the NASA 747 that goes up and down. It's the zero G simulator. There you go. in air quotes again. Um, and they say like, as a lead in to their video, 
this is real. This is done in zero gravity. And it's just like a forehead slapper. It's like, no, like, like, no, like, stop it. All you're doing is just reinforcing the idea that, that there's no gravity in space. And that's completely untrue. It, I don't know. It's one of those things that I have to work really hard to undo because they don't. They're so used to being like, oh, they're just floating. There's no gravity. It, it's it's fun to do. But again, it's one of those things. It's a misconception or an alternate conception, depending on who you talk to. Um but, you know, it's one of those things where you get them to see the world a little bit differently and then they start to realize, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's not the case, you know, you know, and, and, and they start, they're a, the reason why I like teaching physics, and again, so I, I think you know this, but I'll tell everybody, I mean, I'm a chemistry major, you know, I was a chemistry teacher before I started teaching physics. It's so much more tangible. It really makes you stop and, uh, and think about how the world works on an everyday level, you know, from driving your car to riding a bicycle to, to you know, swinging a, a golf club or a baseball bat or, you know, even something, even when you're watching on TV, things like, you know, ice skating or gymnastics. It's, you know, or even stuff like I'm really into weightlifting, you know, so like even looking like weightlifting, it's it's all physics. And it's all it's, Physics is all around us. Exactly. And it's one of those things that I, I think every student should take physics at a, some level or another because it really gives you an appreciation of what's going on around you. But, I mean, I could go on literally for hours about this. But And, and, and I'm not going to bash chemistry. No, not at all. You should you, you No. But <laughs> I, I enjoyed chemistry for like the labs and, the re, and doing those experiments. Oh, yeah. But, but chemistry, I think you see the results of chemistry. You mm-hmm. don't – I mean, you can't see – you know, atoms and the, and the, I mean, you see the results of it, yeah, but yeah. physics, you can watch it happen mm-hmm. in slow motion too. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's one of those things Yeah, if chemistry gets a little more abstract at the, uh, you know, it, when you're talking about atomic theory, it's, you, you can't see protons and electrons, but if I, but if I drop a, you know, bowling ball at the window, that's something that's very tangible. You know, that's, that's a real experience that you can see. So it's, it's fun. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, where can people get in where can they connect with you now? Where where are you? Where do you have a presence? Okay, so I'm on Twitter. My Twitter's a rosy a r o s e y. Um, it's somewhat updated. I've I've drifted a little bit away from Twitter for you know various reasons that I'm not going to enumerate here. Um, but I find Twitter to be more. I'm more of a passive Twitter. Um, participant. Um, you know, following hashtags and following people. Um, not so much participating. I'm more of a consumer than a producer on Twitter. Um, if you ever want to check out my, my class website, it's rosenwald.wordpress.com. Um, that's really easy. Um, but that's really, maybe that's a good example for somebody who's looking to set up a site. Yeah. Um, really all, if you were to go there, pretty much what you'll see is physics memes because I had try and have one every day, you know, on my daily post and, you know, a lot of my classroom resources, I use it more uh, as a repository of resources more than anything else. Um, but those, I guess the two big ways that you could find me online, um, to be, so, so everybody, you need to go out and you need to connect with Alex (laughs) at a Rosie on Twitter. And, and to be fair, full disclosure, pull back the curtain. Um, he's over here at the house of ed tech, for a group cooking dinner event that we like to do from time to time. And he wasn't in my house five minutes when I said, Hey, you want to come upstairs and get on the microphone with me? So oh, yeah. there, there was not a lot of prep. I hit him. I hit, no. I hit you cold. <laughs> oh, ice cold as it were. I did the polar, I did the polar plunge this morning, New Jersey yes, uh, special is. Olympics polar plunge. Alex Rosenwald, ice man. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's a good thing. You're not video. I mean, with the, this beard I got going on, it's pretty, uh, I'm pretty, I, I, it's pretty, what? uh, Hey, with the pretty beard, Neanderthal with the beard. I'm glad this is an audio podcast <laughs> and not a video podcast. <laughs> Too funny. <laughs> so th- thanks for coming into the Dude, house of ed tech, brother. Hey, Chris, always a pleasure. my friend. And thank you once again, to my good friend Alex for literally coming into the House of Ed Tech. Really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to, when possible, to have more guests inside the actual House of Ed Tech. Now, without further ado, let's meet this episode's House of Ed Tech VIP. Congratulations to Mrs. Rachel Murat. Rachel is a high school social studies teacher for Maine Endwell, which is near Binghamton, New York. She's a graduate of Binghamton University, and she is a dedicated teacher who is very, very passionate about student voice. 
So if you're ever looking to get in touch with her on Twitter, uh, be sure to check out the hashtag Stu Voice. She can be found at many ed camps in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania area. She she likes to travel. So I, I've met her a bunch of times. She's a phenomenal woman who really knows her stuff. She is also, in addition to attending many ed camps, she is a co-organizer of ed camp Southern Tip of New York, STNY. And she was also recently named as a Schoology ambassador. I 100% recommend that you connect with Rachel. She can be found on Twitter. Her username is Mrs. Murat, M-R-S-M-U-R-A-T. And you can check out her awesome classroom blog, which can be found at spartansocialstudies.blogspot.com. Congratulations, Rachel. You are a House of Ed Tech VIP. And that's going to do it for another episode of the House of Ed Tech podcast. Thank you again to today's sponsor, Audible. Be sure to go to chrisnessy.com slash audible to get your two free audiobooks and learn and listen to some great content because you listen to podcasts, so you automatically already like to listen to stuff. So go get those two free audiobooks and also help out a podcast you enjoy. This one. Keep the conversation going. And of course, visit my website, chrisnessy.com. You can get all the show notes and the links mentioned in this episode by going to chrisnessy.com slash 55. And the show notes for this episode will again have all the links and information shared by Alex and shared by myself. When you're on the website, be sure to click and share your feedback. Sharing your feedback will give you the opportunity to reach out and let me know what you like, don't like about the show. Give me your thoughts and share your opinions. So you can email me. You can get me on Twitter. My username is Mr. Nessie and just use the hashtag house of ed tech. And of course, don't forget about maybe considering sending in your suggestion for an ed tech thought or your own ed tech thought or sending me your ed tech questions that you'd like to have me answer here on the show. Again, use the hashtag house of ed tech. You can Vox me on Mr. Nessie, or again, the House of Ed Tech hotline phone number is uh, 732-903-4869. Now, if you enjoy the podcast, and really, if you've come this far, I don't know how you're not, uh, do me the, to do me the, ah, <laughs> do me a favor, two things. First, tell somebody, go out and tell somebody else about the podcast, tweet about it, tell a coworker. Spread the word verbally. That's going to be a big help to help grow the audience and the community that I'm trying to build here. Number two, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes. A positive rating and an honest review will help to keep the podcast front and center in clearly the world's largest podcast directory. And that's going to help people to discover and enjoy the content. You can also show your support through Patreon.com. For more information about that, just go to chrisnessy.com slash awesome on the next episode of the house of ed tech i will once again be sharing a teacher story possibly bring caitlin back things are still a little bit up in the air right now as i prepare for another great episode but of course you can count on it being there and episode number 56 will be released on march 13th 2016 as always thank you again for joining me and remember using technology isn't difficult just give it a try. The House of Ed Tech is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators. Podcasts by educators. For more, go to edupodcastnetwork.com.